Hey, thanks for tuning in. We are Living Fit, your trainer's trainer. We not only have education courses for trainers to upgrade their game, but we have full on follow along programs, workouts, exercise breakdowns, nutrition plans, and fitness equipment for you to reach your fitness goals. Now, enjoy the show. What's going on? This is Marcus Martinez with Kettle Kings and Living Up Fit, and this is the Living Fit Show, and this is my very special guest and very good friend, PJ Nessler, the Director of Performance for XPT Life. Right, XPT Life? You got it. All right. <laughs> and uh, he's just an amazing coach, incredibly knowledgeable in breath work and ice work and all these different things that make you a better, more resilient athlete. So there, thank you very much for, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate that introduction as well. I know, I had, I've practiced it a couple of times. <laughs> I don't want to make him bigger than he, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, uh, tell me a little bit. I love your setup. First off, this gym is amazing. I love your setup in terms of what you do with the sauna, what you do with your breath work, but let's just kind of dive into it. Like what got you so interested in breath work and making that kind of more of your specialty? Yeah, XPT is really what got me involved in breath work. I mean, I started as a performance coach. I was working with a, dozens of different athletes from different sports. And I had a friend who was into breath work and kind of helped me tie the she was an exercise physiologist, so she helped me get out of the, you know, spiritual yogi realm of breath work and see where there were some tactical applications. So I started doing a few little things with my athletes for a couple of years. And then when I started working with XPT, breath work is a foundation upon everything that we do at XPT. So my job was really to help kind of understand all of this breath work that they were doing and be able to teach it to coaches and trainers and physical therapist. So I had to really deep dive deep and understand it. Uh, and that's pretty much what I've been doing for four years now is as much different breath work as possible and really trying to like figure out how to put each of these things in it, create a tool behind it. So it's not just like a method, but what does that just specifically do? And then where, how can I use that effectively for different types of people? What's been your biggest carryover from breath work to your athletes? Like what have you seen as like the biggest benefit incorporating that? I really love the breath work. I mean, the biggest thing I incorporated was the first thing we did, which was actually post-workout breathing, down-regulating, recovery breathing to get people out of the sympathetic state. Because I worked with the athletes I was training at the time. We were working with NFL, NHL, and MMA and Jiu-Jitsu. So low impact. There's yeah, exactly. Like Not a lot of stress. Yeah, no stress. Uh, people who are really good at relaxing and recovering. <laughs> so... Especially with the MMA fighters, these guys are training two, three times a day. So incorporating stuff that could help them to down-regulate and actually stimulate recovery was huge. Uh, and then really from there was also incorporating breath work, really just finding, I mean, breath is a part of everything we do. So it was like understanding how we should be breathing to be most optimal, most appropriate for strength training or while we're doing high intensity intervals, uh, because it it is tied into all those things and it's really like just something we all don't think about we neglect it so it's just having that extra tool and you know people always ask me how often i do breath work i don't lay down on the floor and do a half hour of breathing very rarely every once in a while i do sometimes i'll do a five minute routine but the way i apply breath work to everyday life for me and for my athletes is like you're breathing all the time so we're just learning how to breathe most optimally for each of these different situations. Yeah. No, that's so cool. I think it's so interesting to see that trend now into breath work where people didn't even think about it before. And now it's part of pre-workout, post-workout. People are actually taking breath classes and you teach full on workshops on breath, right? Yeah, we teach uh, workshops and certifications. We certify health and fitness professionals in being able to understand it so they can teach it to their clients. So for the regular person who's not an athlete, not an NFL person, where do you see them kind of uh, not taking advantage of breath work? Where do you see them, like, where could they incorporate it more into their life? I think for most people, the, the goal is, again, understanding how you should breathe for everyday health because they're doing it 20,000 times per day. So I always tell people, like, every breath you take is a step towards optimization or dysfunction. There is no in-between. It's just that most of you are just doing it unconsciously. So you're probably taking 80% of them towards dysfunction, but you don't know it. Uh, and the other hard part about it is we don't, you know, it's like if you were walking incorrectly and you did that, you were walking 10,000 steps a day and you did that for a long period of time, 
eventually maybe you have some sort of injury, like some low back injury. And you go to the doctor and they're going to see like you bent over, pick something up. That's what flared up the injury. So that's what they look at. They don't, now we have really good physical therapists who will take a look holistically and be like, yeah, your gait is off and you don't even push off your big toe. You have no access to this. That's what's been wreaking havoc on it, but we don't have that with breathing. So it's really hard to go look at somebody who has some sort of chronic disease and say, well, have you ever thought about the fact that your liver hasn't really been getting the oxygen it needed for the past 26 years? So it's hard to kind of quantify that. So that's the biggest takeaway I think for people is you have to be breathing optimally and, and most people do it wrong. That was, that was going to be my next question. What is the, what's the number one thing you see people doing wrong when it comes to their breath? Everything. <laughs> uh, I think the biggest thing is just the mechanics of breathing. I think, and that's why it's the foundation of what we teach. I think it's super important and it can have huge effects, but you know, we're designed to breathe as humans. We're designed to breathe with the diaphragm and we do that really well when we're born. We do that as kids. And then we start doing this all day. And we have all of these things from kind of modern life and society, which then deteriorates the way that we breathe. And we don't, again, nobody tells us about it. We don't think about it. We just spend our days doing this and it starts to train these patterns backwards. And that reduces the oxygen that we get to all of our cells. It reduces our ability to stabilize our spine. It creates, it just wreaks havoc on every system because you're getting 20,000 reps. So you're getting just so many repetitions of this dysfunctional pattern. Um, so I think the, the mechanics of breathing is something that I've found even people who come to us who say they are breathing experts. We have people who come to our courses who are already certified yoga practitioners, certified uh, Pilates practitioners. I won't name all the other methods, but they're instructors in four different other breathing things. And we lay down and we try to teach them the basics of lateral breathing with the diaphragm and they can't even do it. They have, because they haven't learned the mechanics. They've learned all these like cool, unique little things, but they haven't learned the basic foundation. So I think that's one of the biggest things most people do wrong. And then the other one is a lot of people breathe through their mouths. Way so more than they should. You completely changed my view on mouth breathing. And that's, I always go back to that. Like I started sleeping with a little breath strips yeah. to try to focus on nasal breathing. And I started incorporating nasal breathing after doing a workshop with you. So that's been a total game changer. So explain to us what, like, what is the main thing that nasal breathing would bring to someone? Like most people think like, okay, who cares? A mouth, and a nose, they're both going to the same place, right? right, right. Why nasal breathing? Yeah, so the, the few big things I was gonna ask you too, does the uh, mouth tape stay on your mouth? It does sometimes. And I've, I've only woken up one time and I felt like I was being like kidnapped or something. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> had to tear it off. But outside of that, it pretty much stays on. I mean, a lot of people with facial hair, that's they, exactly. They wake up with it all over the, you know, the bed somewhere. It ends up on my tape too. Yeah. So I'm like, oh good, I got a little mini wax. Yeah. Uh, but I think, so really the nose was designed for breathing. That's what, how we were supposed to breathe. That's why it's there. And it's a major function that it serves. Uh, but because we don't do it often, a lot of us lose the capability to do that. And really, if you think about one of the big things that the nose does in general is it filters, cleans, humidifies the air as it comes through. So it actually prepares that air to go into your lungs so you can use that air effectively. So I, 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 uh, a friend of mine, Brian McKenzie, I, I remember his analogy was breathing air in and out through your mouth is like drinking pond water or puddle water. And drink, breathing air through your nose is like drinking filtered water. So if you think about it, they're both going to the same place, you're still getting water in, but the difference between drinking that water from a filter and, and scooping it up from the pond in the backyard is going to be all that other, other crap that's in there that you're bringing into your lungs. So that's one of the big things that the nose does. The nose also helps to activate the diaphragm, which is, we already mentioned, the, you know, these systems are all intertwined. And one of the big things the nose does is it helps to regulate the airflow because a lot of people think about breathing well, they don't think about breathing, but they just breathe air in and out. But the real purpose, one of the main purposes of ventilation is to bring in oxygen and to bring out carbon dioxide. And the reality is it's not just in and out, it's to create a balance of those blood gases. Because every system in the body is designed for balance. There's always this checks and balances. There's never, there's, there's nothing in the body where you can be like, yeah, I just needed way more of that. There's always gonna be, uh, you know, a cost benefit to that. So that's the whole purpose of ventilation is we need to make sure that we have the right amount of carbon dioxide in our blood, in our body, and the right amount of oxygen. 
So when we breathe in, we breathe in a lot of oxygen. When we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Because carbon dioxide is this waste product that builds up during metabolic activity. But the problem that happens with mouth breathing is carbon dioxide is actually necessary to, act, to re, uh, allow the oxygen to release from the hemoglobin that picks it up. So <clears throat> when you just because you're bringing air in and out doesn't mean you're using that oxygen. So if we sit here and just go, <sighs> I'm bringing a ton of oxygen in. I'm also expelling a lot of it in that next breath. And even the oxygen that's getting picked up in the blood if I don't have the right amount of carbon dioxide, the oxygen is just going around. It's not getting delivered to the cells, to the tissues, and, and that's one of the big problems with over-breathing that we see in, in, and there's a whole bunch, I think there's 800 plus chronic diseases and illnesses and, and ailments that are associated with over-breathing. Um, pretty much everything, because over-breathing reduces carbon dioxide, which therefore reduces the oxygen that's getting delivered to the tissues. So basically, every cell in your body is being slightly starved of oxygen. For 20,000 breaths a day, for 24 hours a day, every single day, for years and years and years, and you can imagine, I mean, let's say your, your liver or your pancreas or whatever, your muscle was supposed to get 100% of oxygen delivered, but every day it's getting 87%. And what actually happens is, because you become worse at breathing, it just gets worse and worse over time. And then you can imagine how much an effect that would have over a long period of time. So that's one of the big reasons that mouth breathing is so detrimental because uh, we don't have any control. And that's why it, it's there as a safety valve. It's a, you and I, we get on this, yeah, if we get on that assault bike and just go all out for five minutes, eventually it's going to get to the point where your, uh, your demand for oxygen and the buildup of carbon dioxide is so high that you need to move as much air as fast as possible. That's what the mouth is for. That's why we start <sighs> breathing like that when we're super, super stressed because we need to move a lot of air quickly to, to balance it back out. But it's all about creating that balance. If you and I sit here and breathe that same way, let's say we're balanced, we're very quickly going to do this and now all the systems can get thrown off. Wow, that's, it's amazing to see just how that can potentially lead to illness that you would never even think about. You get illness, you get a disease, something like that. You're never gonna go back and think, oh, it's because I've been breathing improperly for the last 50 plus years. But how quickly do people see changes when they start incorporating nasal breathing, when they start you know, breathing properly? Sometimes immediately. I mean, we have people who come in, we start doing nasal breathing, we do it during like a light workout and they'll feel a difference immediately. A lot of people, the difference they'll feel immediately is how hard it is to breathe through their nose because they've lost that ability, especially when you start incorporating during activity. But I mean, we have people who, let's use the mouth strips, for example. <clears throat> I have a lot of people who I say, just wear it for a week with my athletes particularly. I gave them strips. I said, wear it for seven days, see how you feel. For sleep or for working out? For sleep. Okay. For sleep. And within two to three days, I have a lot of people like, I've never slept so good in my life because you're supposed to breathe through your mouth, excuse me, breathe through your nose while you sleep all the time, 100% of the time. Okay, you're, ever did you're at rest. <laughs> Most people don't. And now, the other thing mouth breathing does is it also, because it's, it's supposed to be this reserve thing for stress patterns, it actually triggers stress response in the body. So you think about sleep where you should be in your most relaxed, unstressed state, you are not able to get into these deepest levels of sleep because you're breathing in this stress pattern. So you're not even able to get the high quality sleep that you that you need where you're able to recover. So on top of not being oxygenated properly, you're not getting enough sleep, you're not recovering, all of these things come together when you start to breathe properly. Absolutely. And we're only scratching the surface. You know, the, the cool thing and the bad thing about the breath work stuff is that people always ask, who's it good for? Every human being on the planet. What impact can it have? Like where will it impact you? in every activity that you ever do, because breathing is literally the foundation of life. You know, you take it away, you're dead in minutes. You take away food, water, take away water, you're dead in days. You take away food, you're, you can live for weeks. But breath, you can only go for a few minutes because it is the foundation of everything. But that also makes it hard because people, anytime you say everything's for everybody, they're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So we, that's one of the things we did at XPT is we created these methods where we really could specialize. Okay, you're an elite military operator. You're looking to improve your VO2 max and control your emotional state. Boom, I got four protocols that I know can fit that. Okay, you're my 62-year-old mother. 
you're looking to sleep better and also de-stress when you're having stressful days. Perfect, I've got protocols for that. So it's kind of like trying to create these things that people could latch onto. Because if you just say, here's the protocol everyone should do for breathing, you know, if, if it fits everybody, it also fits nobody. Yeah. So, but yeah, because breath ties into everything that we do, it literally can improve everything. So then now take this into cold therapy that you incorporate with the breath work. Because I know breath work is obviously the starting point, but you're very into the cold therapy, the ice and the and, and water, a cold immersion. Mm -hmm. how, how would you, what would you call it? Yeah, cold immersion, cold water immersion. We do cold water immersion. I did it with you once. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, just uh, two and a half minutes, you're good. It's like, uh, it's been 20 seconds, I think I'm really good. <laughs> yeah. So how important is that as to combine it with your breath work and what do you see are the main benefits of incorporating the, the cold immersion therapy? Yeah, so we, we really like hot and cold therapy, both of them. And we can use them a, different, a few different ways. So we, we use them as a stressor. So we can use it to create physiological stress. Just like exercise, there's a host of benefits that happen when you start to expose your body to these different stressors. You know, anything, anything that could potentially kill you if you expose yourself at a smaller dose can be beneficial. So you're vaccinating yourself to cold. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, same as exercise, you know, if, yeah. if I just put that bar on my back and just keep squatting until I and never stop, my body will break down and I'll die. But you know, I have systems in place to make sure I don't keep doing that. But if you kept exercising, if you kept fasting, any of those things, you would die eventually. But in the short term, you can actually trigger, you can elicit adaptations from the body. So we use the hot and cold for that, but particularly around the breath. One of the reasons we use cold specifically at a lot of our XPT experiences and, and things is we call it exposure because we're exposing you to this short-term stressor to give you the opportunity to work on the, the tools that we just taught you to control your breath and control your mind. So a lot of people come to XPT and they're looking for ways to optimize performance. But performance, we get NHL athletes, we get executives, we get Navy SEALs. We, so performance means a different thing to all of those people. So a lot of times what we're teaching them is the, the mindset that underpins performance no matter what area and that you can be an active participant in controlling that mindset. And then the coolest thing I think that we can do at XPT that a lot of people struggle with is you can find tips on mindset and breathing to, to relax and dealing with stress and fear, anxiety, you can find that stuff anywhere. But being able to practice it is really hard because if, let's say, your biggest fear is, is great white sharks, well, the only way for me to get you to be able to overcome that fear and practice, I can tell you all the tools about disassociating your mind and then it's like, okay, and you to do that laying down here meditating and then I throw you in a tank with great white sharks and We've just taken you from zero to extreme, and there's no way you're gonna connect all those dots. But one of the cool things we do at XPT is we, we put you in these high stress, low danger environments. You know, and, and people do it in physical exercise all the time, but the cost of that is a lot. Like I, I could get you to the point of like, I can't do this, there's no way, like mentally break down. It's, it's what Navy SEAL BUDS training is all about, but the cost of that, to do that to a UFC fighter, you can't do it yeah. because they're going to have to recover for two weeks from that kind of breakdown. But if I put them at the bottom of the pool with dumbbells in their hand or a 35 degree ice bath, they immediately get that physiological response <laughs> and their brain starts going, you can't stay in here. You're going to freeze to death. Your hands are falling off. You're, oh my God, how long do I have to stay in here? All of that panic, all of that fear, all of those things come up, but you're safe. You're not in any real danger. And if I left you there for three hours, you would be, but in the three to five minutes you're going to sit there, you're fine. So that gives us an opportunity to practice those techniques. So we, we teach people how to use the breath to disassociate from pain, fear, anxiety. We teach them how to use the breath to actually trigger physiological relaxation. We teach them mindset techniques as well. There's a whole bunch of psychological techniques we teach people on like the basic stuff you hear all the time, you know, shrink. The, the reason people freak out in the ice bath is not about the current moment of the ice bath, right? If, if I say, hey, can you do this for one more second? 100% of people will be like, yeah. A million dollars to stay for five more seconds. 100% of people do it. But the problem is when I go three minutes and then your brain goes, three more minutes, I can't do this for three more minutes. And, and that's where, I mean, in everything, that's where we break down, right? Oh, I gotta start my business, I don't know what to do. Oh, I, gotta, I got this thing and this thing and this thing. Okay, well, what can you control right now? Take one more step. 
take one more breath in the ice bath. Right? Don't worry about three minutes, just give me two more breaths. So we teach people how to shrink these things down where they can really focus on controlling their mind and, and that's practice. And then you just keep practicing it. People will adapt to the ice bath eventually. So that's where you have to find other higher stress environments to keep practicing those tools. But that's where that stuff, those are the things that people leave and say, this experience changed my life. It's not because they spent three days working out and in Kauai and, you know, we didn't teach them magic. It's just, we put them in these environments, we gave them a few tools and then we put them in environments where they got to use them. And then they realized that they were able to overcome stuff. And like, as you know, with anything, once you realize you can overcome these massive obstacles, now you're empowered. You're like, wow, not only am I capable of this, but I also have these tools. You know, I talk about this with anxiety a lot. I, have, um, I know one of the big things with, uh, I have a few friends who are counselors and it's people with anxiety, particularly someone like me, I, I struggle with claustrophobia and traveling was a big thing. I used to bring Xanax with me on the plane and I never took it. I think once I took it, but knowing I had it in my backpack was, enough. was all I needed. Yeah. Cause it was like, whew, I'm starting to feel a little weird. I'll have that Xanax. I don't need it yet. And that's how I felt. And the problem is I'm outsourcing my control to that Xanax. And that's what a lot of people need. They need to have that control because anxiety is all psychological. It's all a fear of, okay, now I'm feeling a little panicky. Well, what if, what if I freak out? Well, then, then what's going to happen? Then if I start freaking out right here, Mark is going to judge me and I'm going to look weird. So that's where that anxiety builds up. So when people know that they have the tools to overcome those things, it brings all the power back. And that's where people leave and they're like, whether it was a special forces guy or my mom, they both write back and they're like, man, this, this thing changed my life. And my question is like, how? Because I'm interested in how you're applying that. Because I know these things are powerful, but it's cool to see how much they apply a different spectrum. I think I went way off that yeah. tangent on cold exposure. <laughs> I, I realized we were talking about cold exposure and I was like... <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, like, man, I've never gotten so pumped up from a question uh, that had nothing to do with what we were talking about. Yeah. But that, was, yeah. that was awesome. Completely fine. Uh, but that's one of the big reasons <laughs> we use cold exposure is to, to teach people those tools. It's to give them that stress that allows them to show them that they have the power to be able to control exactly. their fear, control their anxiety. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's the benefits of the cold in it itself, but you use it more as a, as a that stimulus. Yeah, they would use it as a psychological, and it just, again, it's like everything. It's like, why are you doing this exercise? I could be doing that back squat so that I'm trying to build, you know, maximum strength, or I could be doing that back squat as a mobility exercise. Like, there's so many reasons for it, and that's what we look at those things as. They're tools, and we can apply them to different people for different uh, benefits. So taking it to the average person or to, you know, to the populace, like what would you say is the most accessible, most applicable kind of breath work, the simplest thing that they can do just to change their state? So you talk about anxiety and with everything that's going on and being on social media, being on the news, people get into this heightened state of arousal, you know, most of the time bad, sometimes good, but how would you kind of bring them back to center? How would you get them to just kind of relax? Yeah, that's a great question. I, my answer would have been different six to 12 months ago, and I've actually kind of changed my approach a little bit, but the principles when it comes to controlling breath, I mean, there's a reason that every time someone freaks out in a movie, TV, in real life, right? If, if someone starts freaking out, let's inadvertently, we just breathe, 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 right? Just relax. Because we know they're losing control of their breath. Yeah, just relax, <laughs> calm down. Uh, but breathing, getting control of the breath is one of the biggest triggers because the, the parts of the brain that control our autonomic arousal are closely tied to the parts of the brain that control respiration. So when we can get control, when we lose control of either one, it can wreak havoc on the other, but when we can get control of one, it can also start to get control of the other. So what I like to do to get people to get control of the breath, eventually what we want to do is slow the breath down. But what I've noticed is a lot of people, me particularly, when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm really stressed, it's hard to go from this high state of stress into calm, slow, relaxed breathing. So what I like to do is actually ramp back down. So I like to meet my breath with where I'm at and then take it down a step and take it down a step. Mm -hmm. uh, so or meet my nervous system where it's at. So for example, let's say I threw you in the ice bath, you've never done it before. And we put people in you know, our ice baths for anybody's record, they're about 35 degrees. So it's not the people always say, like, yeah, I did this in high school or when <laughs> I played sports. Sitting in a 60 degree tub, you know, with a, uh, two bags of ice in it, waist deep, 
is very yeah. different from getting in a 35 degree tub up to your neck. Um, but when you put people in there, they start to, <laughs> and if I say breathe in for five seconds and out for 10, no chance. Yeah. So what I like to have them do is do a few quick, fast breaths to meet that nervous system right where that demand is and then scale it down. So the first thing I'll do is three fast, hard breaths, and it can be in the nose, out the mouth, or in and out the mouth, if that's where you're at. Uh, in the ice bath, a lot of times it's the mouth because people are just struggling. So it's just three fast. And I also think about that like a, uh, you know, imagine you just smash your thumb with a hammer. So you don't just sit there and go, ow, that hurts. You shake it, right? And that neural input that you're sending to that hand actually blunts that pain response a little bit. That's why we do that, or we grab it, we squeeze it. That's, we're sending that neural input to try to blunt some of that pain response. So it, you're kind of doing the same thing here. You're, you're hitting the nervous system with these fat, three fast breaths, and then immediately go into, and this is actually a protocol we call three, four, uh, <coughs> three, four, five. We call it the holiday three, four, five, because we were recently given to people to use during the holidays. But now that we're past the holidays, you can use it at any point because, <laughs> um, you can just call it the beginning, whatever works for you. If you're a fireman, call it the fireman three, four, five. Uh, that's actually magic what we do. I, I had stuff that I talked to different people and I called them different things. For my fighters, it was like the combat protocol. And then for other people, it was like the down regulation protocol. <laughs> it's like uh, saying uh, what city you're in, uh, what if you're a rock star. Like, What's up, St. Louis? Yeah. And you go the next place. And yeah. It's like, oh my God, he's talking to me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so three intense breaths followed immediately by four in the nose, out the mouth, and start to slow the exhales down. So, okay. And then right into five, in and out the nose, slow the inhales and the exhales. You don't have to worry about counting of the breath. Now, there's plenty of protocols where I count the breath as well, but what I find is that's a super quick reset. So that's like, Oh man, I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. I need something to get me quickly. I mean, it'd take you less than two minutes to go through that protocol. It's three fast intense, three where we start to slow the exhale. Sorry, four where we start to slow the exhale, five where we slow the inhale and the exhale. We want all those breaths to be into the belly and ribs. So I always say lateral breathing. Mechanics of breathing are going to apply to everything. So breathing into the belly and ribs. So you said lateral breathing before, explain that really briefly. So lateral breathing is where we expand the ribs. The reason I say lateral breathing versus belly breathing, you, you probably heard the term belly breathing. People have heard belly breathing. Belly breathing, the reason that became popular is because when we breathe with the diaphragm, it's this big muscle that goes all the way around here. When we breathe with the diaphragm, it actually goes down and then it'll push down on all my organs, which will actually make my belly expand. So when I breathe in and I go, the problem is with belly breathing, I can hold my breath and do that with my abs. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're breathing with the diaphragm, but it's a great first step for people because a lot of people breathe like this, which is not breathing with the diaphragm. So that's a huge dysfunction. So if you're just belly breathing, that's great, but the better indicator of good diaphragm function is lateral breathing, where we're breathing into the ribs, and that way I can and when I'm getting lateral expansion of the ribs, usually that means my diaphragm is actually contracting, expanding, and that's what's going to create that good breathing. Nice. So think about breathing into your, your rib cage, your whole belly as like a um, 360 degrees, like this big chamber. That's what we want to do when we breathe Got it. all the time, all of our breathing mechanics. Okay. So going back to the, the three, four, five. Uh, so you're not worried about counting. You're not trying to, you know, at this point, you're not trying yep. to do like a five second inhale or 10 or anything like that. Nope. We're just slowing it down, bringing it back down to center, so to speak. Yep. So that way at the end of this, you feel almost like a reset. So for the, you know, for the trainee, for someone like that, maybe they'll use it after a workout, but for just like the average person, maybe they're just, they're starting to, you know, get overwhelmed with things they have to do. They can still incorporate something like this and kind of get back to center. Like you're saying back to center. Yeah. Not even a yogi, so. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, so this protocol is more for like. You're at that peak. Yeah, I'm, I'm super stressed. I need to like get control. I'm losing my, the reason we don't incorporate all the counting is because when you're at that point, it, oh wait, am I supposed to go in for four, out for eight? I can't remember, you know, it's so much input. It's like, just keep it simple. 
three breaths, four breaths, five breaths, slow, and just focus on every stage you're slowing it down. If you do that, you'll get 80% of the way there. Mm. But for someone post-workout, I have a slightly different protocol because post-workout, you're not in a heightened state of psychological stress, right? You're not having an anxiety attack. You're not in this huge, hopefully, you know, <laughs> post-workout. You see my workout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> post-workout, your body is in a heightened state of stress, right? You're still in this sympathetic state but you're not, you shouldn't be in this state of extreme psychological stress where we need to like, okay, I need an emergency to come in, you know, some sort of emergency protocol to help bring me down. So for post-workout, the protocol that I use is, it's basically like the last stage of that. And that's where I actually introduce counting because that's where people will get distracted because it's a longer protocol, it's more drawn out, it's slower. And I find that when my athletes lay down and they're doing the breath work, it's really easy to let your mind wander. And letting your mind wander allows you to stay in this slightly elevated state of stress. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sort of thinking about my to-do list, this happens to me all the time. I work out out here. I'm short on time. I get my workout in. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a three-minute down regulation breath work and then get into my next thing. My biggest problem is I'm already thinking about, okay, I've got to take a shower. i got to make a shake. i got to, and then I get this, we call this, got Marcus coming by. So that's going to keep you in an elevated state of stress. And the breathing, you're just doing kind of behind it, and maybe it calms you a little bit. So I use the counting of the breath to be something that distracts your mind. So I actually, for that, like post-workout, or if you're like end of the day, you come home from work and you're just looking like, okay, I've got five minutes and I want to down-regulate, that's where I would do a protocol where you lay down on the ground if you can, close your eyes, inhale through the nose into your belly and ribs, and inhale for a count of about four or five. Pause briefly at the top, and then exhale slowly out the nose or mouth, your preference, but I like to make a little noise with the exhale. So if I'm exhaling out the mouth, I'll do a hissing. If I'm going out the nose, I'll do an ocean breath exhale where I make some noise from the back of the throat. And I wanna exhale, I wanna, the inhale and exhale should be about a one to two ratio. So if I'm inhaling for four, exhaling for eight. If I'm inhaling for five, exhaling for 10. And you can kind of shift that ratio however you want. It could be three, six, it could be six, 12. Uh, but the goal is as we really extend those exhales, basically all of these little things I just gave you are different parasympathetic triggers. So the closing of the eyes, being mindful of the breath is a, is a trigger. Diaphragmatic breathing is a trigger. Nasal breathing is a trigger. Uh, supine position, laying on your back is a trigger. Extending exhales is a trigger. Uh, <clears throat> breathing in a cadence of about five to seven breaths per minute is a trigger. So these are all parasympathetic triggers. So what we try to do in those situations is let's take advantage of as many of them as we can. Uh, that hissing or humming or that, that noise, that vibration with the back of the throat, all of those things are parasympathetic triggers. So my goal is like, if I'm driving home from work and I'm like, had a crazy day, I got five minutes, I want to just calm down, get myself reset before I go into you know, my, my home life, then I'll do that. You can do that in the car. I'm not going to close my eyes because I'm in the car, but how many of these triggers can I take advantage of? So one to two ratio of inhale to exhale, making a little noise on the exhale, whether it's hissing or humming or the ocean breath. And you can do that for three to five minutes. I find like three is the minimum because it takes usually a minute or two to start to get into that rhythm. It's kind of meditation. Yeah. You, know, you don't even feel like you're getting into a meditative state until you're at least at five minutes. So for the breath work, I find that three is about the minimum, five or six is more ideal. And that's my post-workout right? breathing routine. It's six minutes most of the time, unless I'm short on time, but it's usually six minutes, that protocol, laying out on my back with my feet up on the bench. Uh, and I just go through that uh, pattern. Man, that is... So incredibly useful. I mean, like, I hope you were listening, but <laughs> at this point, if you're not listening, I mean, you can, we'll watch it again. But uh, that's so useful. I just think of that, you know, we're, we're talking in the context of training. Uh, I'm thinking of it as a dad uh, homeschooling. Like, I can absolutely use that yeah, <laughs> for dealing yeah. with things. Um, but that sounds awesome. I'm definitely going to incorporate that. Uh, man, that was, there's been so many nuggets into this. Everything you've talked about, so much awesome stuff. Uh, I like to close these off with a very simple question, and you can you know think about it for a second. But what does living fit mean to you? We've got from specific to general. Yeah, <laughs> living fit. 
I'll give you one word. I can dive deeper if you explain it, but I think living fit to me personally right now means freedom. It's the, that's my biggest goal with my fitness in general is to have the freedom to do the things that I want to do physically. And you know, I'm a I'm super active. I like to do jujitsu and surf and do that stuff. And for me, that's what I train for. I train to be able to do all of those things that I want to do and to never have the limitations. You know, I've always been one of those people who you go on vacation and everyone's like, Oh, we should go uh, rock climbing. I'm not in shape for that. I'm not, that's what, that's why I train. And that's why I train so versatile because I like to be able to uh, never be a liability, whether, you know, if we're going to, I'm going to Mexico next week, we're going to go spear fishing. I can hold my breath for a long time and swim or I'm going to go, you know, surfing. Well, I've got the balance to get up and surf and be able to do those things. And if I'm perfectly confident, if someone says, Hey, let's go uh, horseback ride, never done that in my life, but I'm very confident that because I train the way I train, I can go do those things and, it, and it's not going to be a, a limitation to me. So that's, that's one of the big things for me. Uh, that's why I think living fit brings to people is it brings the freedom to do what you want to do. I love that. Just being able to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, not being limited, not being a liable. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah. So how many people are an absolute <laughs> That's a, that's a Laird Hamilton quote that kind of underpins everything we do at XPT. Don't be a liability. That's awesome. So where can we find out more information about you? What you do, how you do it? Everything about, uh, everything I do is on XPT pretty much. So xptlife.com, you can find all of our courses, all the stuff that we do, XPT Life on Instagram. Uh, we have tons of free information on there. So those are the two best places to find anything from me. Awesome. Well, hope you enjoyed. There, like I said, there's been so much information here. I'm literally gonna be doing my breath practice as soon as I'm done with my workout today. Uh, Loved having uh, loved having you on here. So thank you so much for your time, your expertise, all the stuff that you've put in this. I know this is your passion, all these things that you do. So I really appreciate that. And we will see you on the next episode. Hey, for more interviews like that, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, if you're looking for not only those interviews, but follow along programs, exercise breakdowns, workouts, nutrition plans, and fitness equipment for your fitness results. Make sure you hop on to living.fit, become a member today, and I'll see you on the next one.